All right, guys, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see, today we have two very special guests who are here to share with you um, the results of the research they carried out. And maybe this information that you will, that you will, that you will see today can help you to shape your research topic. Or maybe after seeing this, you may decide to change your, your topic. But anyway, we have, uh, let me introduce Dr. Luis Humberto Rodriguez Silva and Dr. Benjamin Stewart, the, uh, who are going to work with you today during this session, uh, taking into consideration the results from the research called Errores Sintácticos y Semánticos en la Escritura Académica de Aprendices de Habla Hispana. So, doctors, the space is all yours. You're in command of teams. Welcome. Thank you, Teacher Juan Antonio. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, uh, you, some of you, or most of you, all of you might remember me from other classes. Probably I had some of you in in profe, in grammar, or right in grammar. Uh, again, my name is Luis Humberto Rodriguez Silva, and I obtained my PhD in applied linguistics. I got my title in in the year 2017 in November, and from there I sent a research proposal to Dirección de Postgrados, uh, along with Teacher Benjamin, uh, Doctor Benjamin, and it was it was approved uh, last year, and then we started this research project uh, last year in January. So basically, this is a two-year project, and we're finishing, we're finishing with this uh, this semester. And we basically wrote four objectives in the project, and the last objective is to disseminate our final results either through workshops, like we're doing right now. This is the first workshop that we're giving. And through talks. And, and teacher Benjamin and I, we have uh, given some talks in, in some congresses here in Mexico, uh, national and international, right? So basically, uh, that's my, my introduction. I'd like uh, Dr. Stewart to do the same, please. Yeah, one of our goals today with you guys, um, knowing that this class requires a literature review, and uh, uh, Maestro Tonio is going to be talking a lot about the importance of trying to link what you guys are doing in this class with what you're going to do next semester in thesis seminar. Our goals today are to try to do two things. One is to talk about kind of the process that we went through in doing the research, and which is probably more important and more relevant and uh, more useful to you at this point. Um, then the second part, sharing the research itself. Like uh, Dr. Luis Humberto said, we are planning on doing a formal talk with the academy and the whole student body, everyone in the, the major, uh, to share the results. And uh, today, hopefully, we can share some of those results with you so that you can have an idea about uh, our topic. But again, we want to stress today with you the process that we went through uh, to collect, actually to choose a topic, to collect data, to uh, the actual process that we went through to analyze the data and now present it so that you can hopefully take some tips from what we uh, learned and what we're sharing with you and figure out how you can apply those in your own uh, class, both this semester and next semester. These two classes are very much related, and so uh, it's really not too early to begin thinking about who your participants are going to be, um, you know, how you're going to collect your data, what schools you're going to go to, 
basically the problem, the research problem that you're going to be considering, all of those things need to be taken into consideration this semester as well. So a lot of things to think about and talk about, but hopefully through our discussion with you today, you can be thinking about your own topics and hopefully asking questions that really relate to your topics. And uh, we're here today to hopefully give you some ideas to uh, think about uh, in, in this class. Okay. So again, thank you for having us. And uh, Luis Humberto, if you want to take over. Yeah, sure. I'm just almost ready with the presentation. Probably, I mean, I don't have a problem if you guys want to jump in with questions as we present. Um, you know, sometimes it's easier to you uh, ask the questions here as we present the ideas. So uh, we want to make this as conversational as possible. Uh, so feel free to post your questions. And uh, uh, if Tonio, if you could help us out with, with those. Of course. Can I record this session? Yeah, sure. I forgot to ask. I'm actually recording. If there are any objections to me okay. recording, <laughs> let me know. Not for me, but I don't know about guys. <laughs> well, if anybody has problems or is just does not want the recording, just uh, tell Tonio and he can tell me and yeah. we'll destroy it. <laughs> we'll destroy it. We'll destroy it. We will. Okay, guys, uh, one more thing. Uh, the beginning of this year, back in January or February, last semester, uh, Dr. Benjamin and I, we were thinking about uh, these types of workshops. And obviously, at that time, we were thinking that uh, we want to be doing workshops in, in classrooms, not, not this way. So obviously this is a bit more of a challenge because uh, we cannot give you handouts or be just face to face to uh, answer your questions and, and whatever may come out in, in the classroom. So this doesn't stop us for, for doing this, but um, uh, this is more like a combination of a talk and a workshop because uh, there are so many activities that we can't really do this way, but we're going to try to do one or two activities with you guys. So basically, we, we'd like to start by showing you the presentation, the presentation that you already uh, got from teacher Juan Antonio. The idea, the idea was that you uh, saw, you read the presentation in advance, so when we're explaining some things there, uh, it will be clear to you, right? What I didn't send, teacher Juan Antonio, uh, was the handouts that we're going to be using for the activities that we're going to be asking you to do. Basically, there's only one or two activities that we're going to be doing, right? This, these handouts or these activities, I just included them in the presentation. I just put them at the end, and, and you're going to get to see them after we present uh, the methodology part of our research and the things that we did, and then the activity that you're going to do. Okay, any questions here? Don't, don't be like my protest students. They're, they're very quiet. That's okay, because this is very early. No, teacher, no questions. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. is working, but I don't see the presentation, so what's going on? Okay, now it's there. A little yeah. bit low the platform right now. Can you see it now? 
Yes. Yes. So yes, teacher. This this research was started by by the two of us at the beginning, uh, and then in the second year this year, uh, the Dr. Silvia Rodriguez Narciso uh, she started helping us in the statistical analysis, uh, which you're gonna see in some of the slides on this PowerPoint presentation. So hopefully she will be joining us uh, later today to explain the statistical analysis uh, that we're presenting to you, right? And I want to clarify if we go to the to the presentation con diapositivos. I want to clarify that this presentation does not include uh, a literature review and I was does not really include uh, a formal literature review because we just sent two article proposals uh, to see if they are accepted and published later on. One article as a chapter of a special edition of a book that this university is going to publish probably this year or beginning next year. We don't know that yet. And we sent another article proposal to ELT Journal. And hopefully that article will get accepted and will be published. That one definitely is going to be published next year because uh, journals, uh, it takes about six, eight or ten, sometimes one year, sometimes one year and a half for an article proposal to be accepted and to be published. So this is the reason why I we didn't include a literature review for this uh, workshop, for this presentation, uh, because uh, we can't do that until or unless we already have uh, an article published, officially published in some journal or book. What I did send later on to teacher Juan Antonio was a complete article that, that was published in the electronic journal of the Association of Anupi Copay. And, but that article was, uh, it only contains uh, the preliminary results that we had the first year of the project. So I know this is important for you, so you know how to organize your literature review, right? Uh, as soon as these other two articles get published, we'd be happy to share, to share those articles with you if they get published, right? Uh, we cannot uh, share that uh, right now. So what you see in this, what you see on the second slide is the objectives of the project, not the objectives or the research questions or the hypothesis of our study. And, and teacher Juan Antonio just read to you the name of a research project, and that name. Uh, change internally, but it, it cannot change in, in the project because that's how the project was accepted uh, last year. So I decided to write the name of the project and I decided to include the objectives of the project, right? So we have the first one. We already have uh, the first year, that's what we did. We identified the types of writing errors of participants. And then uh, we compare participants in tactic and semantic errors. And this year, last semester, we correlated writing errors and linguistic profiles. That's the new variables that we added to our research project, to our study. And today, we're basically doing, uh, we're presenting results in this first workshop, okay? Uh, Luis, could I add something there? Yeah, sure, you can. 
anybody teacher Juan Antonio, any student in this seventh semester or uh, Dr. Benjamin, you can jump in at any time. Uh, one of the hardest things, I think, uh, in developing a literature review for academic writing here is to think about a problem that really relates to later you uh, extending beyond the literature review into a study. So we always recommend that and encourage students to try to create a literature review this semester, one that they can use next semester in thesis seminar. So what this means is that you tr need to try now to think about a problem that you can link and build and create a literature review around. And even though in our case we have, these are our objectives, our problem that we were pursuing really relates to the writing skill being the most difficult of the four skills. And also thinking about in terms of our uh, our program here at the university, how we can um, maybe uniform, maybe create a way to uh, find ways to help students throughout the BA, the writing skill, and so that we can have some consistency from semester to semester in how we evaluate and what expectations we have for developing the writing skill. But in your case, when you guys are thinking about your own topics, think about the problem and pr perhaps even the research questions uh, or uh, yeah, the research questions that are going to pertain to your study, even though this semester you're not going to be asked to collect data, it's not too early to think about those things uh, so that when you go into next semester, uh, you have a really good working uh, literature review that you can base the rest of uh, the semester on. So I just wanted to throw that out. Uh, be thinking about your uh, problem, your researchable problem here uh, as you're finding articles, primary research articles uh, that will support your uh, literature review. Any questions or comments about what just Dr. Benjamin said? No. Okay, I'm going to make a, a very brief break because Dr. Silvia Rodriguez Narciso just sent me a WhatsApp and she's saying that she cannot access this meeting. So, Tonya, can I give you her phone number so you can solve that, please? Yes. I think it's better to call her. That will be faster. Her phone number is 449 Ya estoy aquí adentro. Buenos días. Okay, perdón. Okay, she's here now. Sorry. Okay. Buenos días, doctora. Buenos días. Buenos días a todos. Buenos días. ¿Puede, puede ver la presentación, doctora Silvia? Sí, sin ningún problema. Okay. Uh, we're doing this presentation. Estamos haciendo esta presentación en inglés. Si hay alguna pregunta que guste hacer en español, la puede hacer sin ningún problema. Eh, si quiere usar su idioma inglés, también adelante. Bienvenida. ¿Sí? Ok, muchas gracias. Ok, we continue. So, in this, in this research project and, and the different articles that we have written, we had focused mainly, we started with with accuracy, but then we decided also to include the dimension of complexity and fluency. And for accuracy, complexity, and fluency, basically we consider the, uh, let's call it the sub-dimensions of syntactic, uh, syntax, morphology, and lexicon to classify or categorize the, the, the types of errors that we uh, were going to uh, detect in the essays that we ask the learners to write. Okay. Uh, Benjamin, can you continue, please? Okay, um, so just to provide just a very general uh, background, we looked at different studies to analyze different ways of analyzing um, uh, English text. 
there are many different ways. In this case, we have some that really emphasize syntactic and semantic errors. And we uh, were looking at those, getting some good information about how to classify different error types, but we found that uh, we didn't want to classify semantic errors and contrast semantic errors with syntactical errors uh, because for us, everything falls under the umbrella of semantic errors. But it's important, it was important for us to compare and contrast how other researchers were really evaluating uh, and analyzing different errors so that we could see, well, do we need to follow that um, do we need to do something similar or should we do something different? In our case, we decided uh, we needed to do something uh, differently, but this does provide important background information because obviously this is in the literature and this is way this is a, a way that some other authors have decided to classify air types, even though for our purposes we decided to do it differently as as we saw in the prior slide. It says here, other studies have focused on analyzing syntactic, morphological, and lexical. So this is basically what we decided. So here we just basically have contrast be between, okay, do we need to classify them in terms of syntactical errors and semantical errors, or would it be better to divide it up into syntactical, morphological, and, le and lexical errors? We chose the latter. Next slide, please. So one of the things that you guys need to consider and include in your literature review is uh, to define, to determine your keywords for your literature review, which is going to be your empirical study later on. And then uh, you need to provide with a definition of those keywords or variables. In our study, uh, one keyword variable is obviously error because that's at the core of what we did, what we're doing. And then we, we looked at different definitions of error and then we just considered this one as the, the most appropriate uh, according to our objectives and according to what we, we were pretending to do right from the beginning, right? So we obtained this uh, definition of error from Richards and Schmidt. This is an excellent uh, specialized linguistic uh, dictionary. Uh, you can actually uh, download it from internet. Uh, you didn't hear this from me, right? Because that's a you. Let's continue. And then as teacher, as Dr. Benjamin just explained before, we decided to classify the errors that we found as syntactic. And then we have here what a syntactic error is and the type of error like missing words and sentence fragments and others. And the same for morphological errors. So here we define what they are, and then we give the specific uh, situations or instances uh, where you can find uh, how errors are classified into these categories. So those errors are that refer to tense, subject verb agreement, passive formations, and so on and so on. That's how we classify the morphological error. Basically, this is uh, the greatest classification of uh, academic written errors. And then obviously we did the same for le uh, lexical errors. And here we're just referring to word choice and word form. For me particularly, I was confused at the beginning. I was always thinking that word choice errors and word form errors were basically the same. But looking at the literature, uh, they are not. There's some difference there. So you have to be very clear about uh, the variables that you're investigating, whether you're having a classification of, of one or some of your variables, and you got to make sure that that classification is the one that you need, is the one that you want according to your purposes and according to the scope and depth 
of your literature review, of your study, basically. One uh, of the, if I could add, uh, Luis, um, one of the hardest things, guys, to do when you're developing your literature review is to really include only the information that is relevant to your study. And the challenge for you this semester is to, again, think and anticipate, okay, what what do you plan on doing for your research? Uh, let me give you an example. We've talked now about errors, okay? That's one of our key words. Now, if you look at the literature, you're going to have literature that talks about the difference between a mistake and an error. But but for us, we... For us, it's, it wasn't important uh, to, uh, that wasn't really the focus of the study to be able to distinguish between the difference between a mistake and an error. So we just talked about errors, and we only included the term error in our literature review. That's one example. Let me give you one, a second example. I mentioned earlier that we saw in the literature the some researchers talk about syntactical errors and semantical errors. And then later we decided, no, we're going to talk about syntactical errors, morphological errors, and lexical errors. So we're not going to include semantical errors a lot in our literature review, right? Because we chose for the purposes of our study that it makes more sense to focus on syntactical errors, morphological errors, and lexical errors. So that those three types of errors are going to be the bulk of what we talk about in our literature review. It doesn't, it's not necessary, don't think of the literature review like a history lesson. You don't have to provide all of this long history of every possible term that was defined. You just stick to the terms, the key terms and ideas that directly relate to the study. Again, uh, thinking about, in your case, next semester, who are your participants, what are the research questions, and so on. For us, you know, we went back and forth between, okay, who, um, you know, what's our literature review and who are our participants? We had long discussions about what we're going to include in our literature review and what we're not going to include. What we're showing here is, are the decisions that we made, but this was, this was after having talked about it for a long time, really thinking about our literature, I mean, our research and our participants, our context here at the university and, and so on. So um, I just wanted to throw that out in thinking about being very selective in what you include when you develop your uh, literature review for this academic writing course. Yeah, I just will, I, I, I'd like to add that uh, following, following Benjamin's idea that uh, it is very easy to deviate from your topic of your study of your literature review because there's so much information out there. So just need to, uh, this is one of the most difficult things to do when it comes to writing the literature review. You have to be very selective. Uh, otherwise, you, you, you will end up writing about something else and not about the to your topic, your interest, right? I don't know if uh, teacher Juan Antonio has to say something about uh, this, what uh, Dr. Benjamin just said. That's fine, I totally agree with you. It's something that we've been talking about. Okay, so let's, let's continue, thank you. So then uh, once we decided what kind uh, what kind of errors we were going to identify and then classify, then we have to uh, decide, determine uh, how or what situations or how we will class, uh, how, God, how can I say this, uh, Benjamin, regarding to the dimensions of accuracy, uh, complexity, and fluency? Well, yeah, the, the idea we originally thought uh, that we're just going to focus on accuracy, right? And when we focus on accuracy, that's where we look at all the different error types. Uh, m m not all, most of the error types that we look at fall under the category of accuracy. But we later decide, decided that, that if we just only focus on accuracy, we're not covering also complexity 
and fluency to provide more of a contextual uh, idea of, around accuracy. We felt that, well, we wanted to see, does it matter you know, to the level of complexity? Should we also be thinking about complexity? Should we also be comp- thinking about fluency? And then how those three relate to each other over time, right? And that was our intention. And we're sharing this with you. We're kind of talking out loud, thinking out loud here of the process that we went through. We first thought accuracy. That's the only thing we're going to focus on. But then later we said, no, we're going, and we were right in the middle of the study. We were, this was, these are decisions that we're making during the, throughout the the process. We thought, okay, we're also going to include complexity um, to, and also fluency, right, to see. Uh, and we'll, we'll share the results here in a few minutes, but uh, what I want to stress the importance of is the decision-making process here as we're de- deciding on this, uh, that we wanted to expand these three uh, aspects, right? Uh, so not to only focus on accuracy because most uh, most teachers, their conversations around uh, error correction only deal with accuracy, and there's less discussion about complexity and, flu- and fluency. Thank you, Benjamin. So once we decided that we wanted also to include or we needed to include the dimension of complexity and fluency, then uh, the next question is, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to measure the errors regarding accuracy, the errors regarding complexity and fluency? So we looked at the literature and we found uh, Wolf Quintero, Inagaki, and Kim's book uh, published in 1998. This is on page 14, where they give definitions of these dimensions and they also uh, share their knowledge and guide researchers on how to measure this. Uh, And obviously Hunt uh, in 1965 came up with this idea of T-unit. Basically T-unit means terminal unit, that's what it means. And he came with this uh, kind of formula or measure to measure uh, the complexity uh, dimension, right, which we're going to see later on. And this is related to clauses. That's that's, uh, the way it works. So we're going to see that later on instead of just explaining it right now uh, in the abstract, in an abstract way. I don't know if you want to add something else about this, Benjamin. No, I think we can go ahead and move on. So now we're going to continue with the study. And obviously we have our research questions. The first one, what are the salient syntactic, morphological, and lexical errors encountered by second semester students of a VA in EOT in composition writing? And our second research question, what is the relationship between learners' writing errors and their linguistic profiles. Continue, Benjamin, please. So the method section, this is the way in which we collected the the data, uh, includes the following. The participants, we had 31 learners from the BA uh, in our BA from first semester. We had 12 males and 19 females. The, ling- the English proficiency intended for this level of course was between a B1 and a B2 range. And uh, the, uh, the mean age was 20.75 years. Range was 19 to 25. Next, please. And so the instruments and procedures. Okay, so the, uh, the main instrument, we basically ask uh, students to create an essay based on a topic, friendship. So we presented a picture, an image, uh, and asked students to create a story around the image that they saw. The image was of two people uh, hugging each other. 
It was a picture from the back, so you couldn't even see their faces, but it was basically just to give them an idea of some, um, some idea that they could base a story around. And they all shared, it was just one image, and we were there as they were developing their text, their stories around that, that image. They had 50 minutes to complete the uh, essay. And again, it was under supervision. We were there. It was, this was done face to face. This was back when we had face to face classes. And so we were there uh, supervising uh, throughout answering any questions that they had. We also included an online questionnaire to obtain demographic information if, or information about their linguistic profiles or their linguistic histories, basically asking questions like um, how many uh, speak English in your, in your household, uh, how often do you uh, listen to the radio in English, watch TV, and so on, just to get kind of a, a profile of each learner, each participant, and um, for, for the purposes of, of this study. Any questions so far, guys? Now, even though uh, you guys are not going to be asked to complete a method section, I'll just wonder, just another reminder that you need to be thinking about your participants. You need to be thinking about maybe even a school that you could collect the data. You need to be thinking about a problem that relates to the objectives of your study. Again, even though you may not be asked to complete that for the semester, uh, try to Think about those things so that you have a context to build your literature review around. Okay. Dr. Silvia, can you explain? Dr. Silvia, puede. Sí. Adelante. La palabra, por favor. Sí, ¿me escucha? Sí. Ok, perfecto. Sí, este relacionado, bueno, con todo el estudio que llevaron a cabo, eh, ellos generaron, se generaron varias variables. Y como se mencionó, pues la idea es ver si existe alguna relación de los errores con las características este, de los estudiantes, con la exposición al, al idioma inglés, este, al hablar, al escuchar, y también con el perfil este, histórico que, que tienen los alumnos. Entonces, en este caso se consideró un modelo este, de regresión, específicamente un modelo de Poisson, un modelo de regresión eh, es un modelo estadístico que nos permite eh, analizar o ver si hay alguna relación de una variable con respecto a otras eh, que, se, que se tenga interés, ¿no? Entonces, es, es muy interesante ver cómo se relacionan se relaciona estas áreas o todas las áreas en sí cuando tú estás trabajando este, fenómenos específicos y en este caso usarlo con modelos de, este, estadísticos. Entonces salen cosas muy interesantes como vamos a, a mostrar este, a continuación. No sé si puedo pasar a la, a la que sigue. Ya, ya está ahí. Sí, ok. Sí, eh, aquí están algunas de las variables que se consideraron. En el modelo de regresión se suelen considerar dos tipos de variables, una variable de respuesta y un grupo de variables independientes. Entonces en este caso las variables independientes que se consideraron se presentan aquí, están denotadas con las letras Q, que es el género, el número de veces que conversaron con amigos o familiares en algún país, las horas por semana que pasaron hablando el idioma inglés, este, fuera de los cursos que, que es, es, toman ahí en la, en la universidad, eh, las horas por semana este, que enseñaron inglés a otros de manera formal o informal. ¿Puedo pasar a la siguiente, doctor? Sí, doctora. Gracias. Eh, otras variables son estas que están mostrándose aquí. Eh, son las horas por semana que hablaron inglés en casa, eh, las horas por semana que escucharon in, eh, el in, en inglés la radio o viendo la televisión en casa, eh, las horas por semana que escucharon inglés este, en línea, la asistencia eh, eh, posteriormente, se vienen las variables relacionadas con los antecedentes en el idioma inglés de los estudiantes, como son la asistencia a una secundaria en la escuela privada pública, horas por semana tomando clases de inglés en, las escuel en la escuela secundaria en la cual asistió, y las horas por semana que tomaron clases privadas de inglés fuera de, de tu experiencia también este, cuando se estudiaba en la escuela secundaria. 
comfortable with all this uh, data, then we proceeded to do our analysis in fluency, accuracy, and complexity. We, here we just explained that punctuation was not considered with the, or spelling, with the exception of the usage of the comma for the comma splice, comma splice errors and run on sentences. But other, other uh, uses of the comma and spelling problems were ignored because that was not what we were pursuing in, in our study. Uh, Benjamin, can you continue, please? So here we have a list of the total errors, and um, we have labeled them. We've abbreviated uh, for syntactic, morphological, and lexical er uh, learn as to, um, errors, and we've basically ranked the error types most frequent towards the top to the least frequent and the percentage of errors. And so word choice, for example, would fall under lexical errors and so on, word form, morphological. <clears throat> so here you see a list of uh, the error types and the frequencies. Uh, remember that most of these, in fact, all of these errors are falling uh, under these three different categories. All right, And uh, we wanted to see uh, and group first, basically across all errors, which were the most common. All right, and we had a total of 901 uh, errors that that we detected. Now, what we didn't mention is that every single error that we detected went through a process of uh, Maestro Luis Humberto and myself looking at all of the text, and we're going to see some examples here in a few minutes, how we went about and uh, labeled these errors. But every error was checked individually by both of us and then we got together and negotiated through every single uh, of, of the 901 errors and so that we reached a decision for for each for each one next uh, slide I don't know if there's anything else uh, doctor if you want to add no that's fine okay so here we've divided, well, uh, we divided up uh, into now the syntactical errors, the morphological errors, and the lexical errors. So here we have the results of the syntactical errors and a breakdown, a pie chart, really showing the percentages of all the errors that fall under this error type. We had a total of 222 syntactical errors, or 25% of all errors were labeled as syntactical errors. Here we see the breakdown comma splice and missing word being uh, the two most common types. Um, and uh, uh, this was, uh, just speaking from experience, nothing uh, uh, surprising. Uh, next slide. Here we have breakdown of morphological errors. And uh, we had a, a total of 399 morphological errors or 44% of total errors were categorized as morpholo morphological errors. Here we have more of a breakdown division of a wider range of error types, word form, verb tense, articles, and prepositions. Of course, agreement as well with the corresponding percentages within this category, right? So 32% of all morphological errors were word form, right, and so on. This is the breakdown for this error type. Next slide. Uh -huh. Again, guys, jump in. If anybody has questions, right, uh, feel free to, to jump in. Our third type, lexical errors. We had a total of 251 lexical errors, or 28% of total errors were categorized as being lexical. Basically, just two error types, as you see here, word choice and wrong words. Okay, so not a lot of different types of errors, but very important nonetheless. This is 28% of the errors. That's a, that's a big percentage of error type to consider. So even though it's not a lot of error types, it's obviously uh, really important to know that these are error types that fall under this category. And, um, you know, when we're thinking later and talking to teachers about their own teaching practice, these are the things, these are the conversations we need to have about uh, these three different types of error types and 
how to go about helping learners uh, develop those those error types and really trying to get the quote biggest bang for your buck when you're helping learners what do you decide on and what do you focus on okay so basically these are the three error types next slide so t units as we mentioned before uh, it's a sentence that has a main clause and any uh, any um, subordinating clause uh, that is attached to it right so here we have t unit analysis now here we have uh, 1.57. Now this percentage here, if we look at this complexity, it's total clauses. This is how we figured or calculated this ratio. Total clauses over total T units. So we counted all the clauses of a text we counted all the T units. Again, a T unit is going to be, for example, a complex sentence, right, will be a T unit. And we figured this ratio. So the point we want to make here is by itself, this may not uh, have a, a lot of significance, but it's within the context of accuracy and fluency. And over time, figuring these ratios, this will provide context and this was the point that we wanted to make in this study is to be able to say that complexity ratio either is being is the same over time or or it's not in our purposes for our study we weren't interested in seeing what the complexity ratios changed over time but when you take this study and you build on this study which is something we recommend other researchers to do they can take this information, take it a step further, and uh, develop a, a better idea about complexity if they measure this ratio over time. Uh, fluency, we figure the total words over uh, the total T units. Now, uh, we talked about this book, and it's hard to see here, but this is the book that we got uh, this information from. This is a really good book that really shows the different types of ratios that have been used in different studies. And the ratios that we decided to use were the ones that were the most recommended and most accurate uh, based on a lot of different studies that are, that are being out there. But this analysis uh, here is uh, for accuracy, complexity, and fluency. Again, trying to show the contextual uh, makeup of our participants for our study. The complexity, 1.57, you have total clauses over total T units. All right, so basically you have, um, let's say, if you had every sentence that was, the, po the point here is probably one out of one and a half sentences were T units. All right, so... If a student wrote one sentence that was just a simple sentence, right, this would be a total clause and it would be one T unit. And there, so the ratio would be one. All right, so as the, in, the, the percentages increases, you're saying that there are more subordinating clauses that are being included. So if you have a 1.5 ratio, it's like saying you have one sent you have two sentences that someone develops. One sentence has a relative clause, the other sentence does not. So the idea is to increase that percentage to a degree, right? That you have more subordinating uh, clauses, like a uh, subordinating clause. It could even be a relative clause, right? Um, it could even be an embedded nominative clause. But the idea here is that the, the idea of complexity is that it's not just a simple sentence. And the higher ratio will indicate that there are gr more relative clauses that are in the text. Okay, The fluency is, I think, fairly straightforward. You have total words over total T units. And so basically the it's just a word count. And you, you type, you figure out all of the words that they use, and you divide that over 
uh, the T units. So there's all there's going to be a limit to these percentages. It doesn't mean that these numbers and percentages are indefinite and it, they'll just the higher the better, right? Um, but it just provides context when you're comparing accuracy, right? Over time, you're com you're also considering complexity. It's like I wouldn't look at any one of these ratios individually. <clears throat> It re they really need to be considered together. And if you're either going to do it like what we did as a snapshot, all right, that's this is would be the beginning. Like if we take the same group and did the same study now after uh, a couple of years, then we would compare that and say, okay, are their text more com complex or not? And when we're teaching English language learners to write, we need to be also thinking about, okay, we're checking errors, but how, what kind of sentences are they writing? Are they writing all simple sentences? Are they writing all compound sentences? All right, what about relative sentences? What about relative clauses? All right, because we found that a lot of students uh, that are developing the writing skill that at a, are at a lower level use few relative clauses they use very few nominative clauses um, and uh, subordinating clauses okay yeah, and, this is, and this is something that uh, when we looked at the literature uh, we didn't we didn't find uh, much many studies on that measure complexity and fluency most of the studies that we found, they, they basically, they devoted uh, their, their measures on accuracy uh, independently of the type of errors that they were looking at, that researchers were looking at. So this is very important. Uh, some researchers, some linguists argue that uh, evaluating uh, a student's written work based on accuracy only is it is not a fair deal. Uh, complexity should be included as well. So, so then we can see the the development uh, that this learner is has or is having uh, in a specific course, right? So what about Benjamin about the 16.67% for accuracy? How do okay. you interpret that? Ah, okay, yeah, it kind of it kind of skipped over that. So total errors, all right, so the ratio is total errors over T units. And this is basically just the percentage um, of the students that had that had errors, right? So you could look at it as um, you know, the number, the percentage of errors that they made in each sentence. Okay, so uh, the lower the better. You want a lower percentage rate for this particular uh, case. We could have done the inverse and said uh, included a percentage that's accurate, right? But this is total units over, <coughs> over total T units represents the percentage Correct. All right. So this percentage is actually the percentage uh, uh, correct. So for accuracy, the lower the percentage, the better. For complexity, the larger the percentage, the better. And for fluency, the larger the number, the better. Is that correct? Yeah. So I'm. I'm I'm checking here because we actually figured it twice. I'm in. In as we were doing this study. Um, the, because this is a negative one here, so this is actually the percentage correct. So the higher percentage is better of accuracy. So I, I misspoke this 16%, the higher the percentage, the better. If this were a hundred percent, there would be no errors, right? If you want to look at it like that, a hundred percent accuracy would be no errors for, uh, for that particular text. Okay. So that's inverse, right, for accuracy? Yeah, we did the inverse because it was a little bit, yeah, uh, conf I think it's easier to think of the accuracy, the percentage correct when you're labeling it uh, accuracy. So that's yeah. why we did uh, the negative one to show the inverse. Yeah, I'm asking you to interpret these numbers because I myself had some problems when we were calculating 
the accuracy and complexity and fluency. So I just want, uh, I want to make sure that our audience understands what these percentages and this number, this number mean, right? Right. And I got confused because we actually presented this at a conference and we, I think we presented like 83% accuracy yeah. where we actually presented the percentage yeah. wrong. So that was my confusion. This, uh, we're showing the percentage correct. Again, the higher percentage, the better. Okay. We continue. Thank you, Benjamin. So here we just have an example of, uh, uh, sentences in which you have, in which you could measure the complexity, and here we have, uh, we have to measure the T units for every sentence. So again, a T unit is uh, a sentence with an independent clause plus uh, the subordinating clauses or dependent clauses included. So some some complex sentences might be more complex to write than others. We have we have dependent clauses with because, we have dependent clauses with who. These are these are adjective clauses, of course, and adverb clauses. And these are the type of sentences that we found in the students' writings. Right? I don't know if you want to add something else about this, Benjamin. Uh, no, again, just the key point with this slide is that um, as teachers, we don't want to think that every error is the same. It really depends on the context. In this case, we want to show different ways of writing, and some are more complex than others, and that could, uh, it may or may not influence the, the, uh, the accuracy, the errors that they commit. Okay. Uh, Silvia, can you... ¿Puedes explicar esta tabla, por favor? Claro. Sí, recordemos que en las láminas anteriores se mencionó, de, para ver si los errores totales en la escritura, los errores sintácticos, los morfológicos y los léxicos están relacionados con el perfil oral lingüístico, el perfil lingüístico auditivo y el perfil lingüístico histórico de los alumnos entonces se llevó a cabo este, estos totales de errores como variables independientes y como variables, perdón, variables depend, dependientes y como variables independientes, la lista de variables que, que mencionamos con, están denotadas con la letra, las letras Q. Entonces, en estos casos, el resultado que arrojó el análisis de regresión de Poisson nos, nos contempla este tipo de, de resultado. Entonces, por ejemplo, aquí, en la variable, en la columna que tenemos total de errores, se refiere a que la variable total de errores, o sea, todos los errores acumulados por los estudiantes, se llevó a cabo el análisis de regresión para identificar cuáles fueron esas variables que son significativas, es decir, que aportan información o que están relacionadas con el total de errores. En este caso, los valores de los coeficientes asociados a estas variables, a las variables Q, eh, los valores están en la, en la segunda columna y los respectivos P valores, que los P valores son este, probabilidades que nos indican qué tan, eh, mientras más pequeño es el valor del P valor, nos dice que la variable correspondiente o sea, de las columnas, es significativa. Significa, quiere decir que aporta información sobre el total de los errores. Entonces, las variables que tienen los valores más pequeños son el intersecto, bueno, eso no tiene realmente mucha validez, está la variable Q6, la variable Q10, y son las que tienen una mayor significancia en el total de errores. Y el resto de las variables que tienen un, uno o dos asteriscos también son importantes, pero en mayor medida son las variables Q6 y Q10. Eh, aquí este, es importante observar que no este comportamiento que vemos aquí para el total de errores eh, es diferente al que nosotros ahora si manejamos la, como, variable in, como variable dependiente el total de errores de sintaxis. Eh, vemos aquí sus coeficientes, coeficientes correspondientes, y sus P valores. Aquí notamos nosotros que la variable, a diferencia del caso anterior, la variable asociada a, la, a Q1, Q2, 
y que también se repitió en el anterior, Q9 y Q10 son las variables que me están diciendo que están relacionadas fuertemente con el total de errores. ¿Qué quiere decir? O sea que estas variables en conjunto me dicen que están muy relacionadas con el total de errores de sintaxis. Similarmente, el total de errores morfológicos nos indica también que la, aquí en este caso solo existe una variable que es dominante o que es la más significativa en este análisis, que es la variable Q6. Posteriormente, para el total de errores léxicos, la, las variables más significativas son la variable Q6 y la variable Q10. Si nosotros observamos en el análisis global de estas variables, nos gustaría saber cuál es la variable que más domina en todos los casos. Entonces tenemos aquí la variable Q6. Este, entonces vemos aquí que Q6, si me recuerda, doctor, la Q6 en la lámina anterior, que no recuerdo en este momento a qué se refiere a Q6, por favor. Doctora. Si no, déjeme que lo... Ah, aquí está. Sí, es el, las horas por semana, escuchando la radio o viendo la televisión en inglés en casa. O sea, esa es la variable que más este, información nos está dando con respecto a los errores que, que estamos encontrando. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Que a mayor cantidad de error, mayor, que mayor, si, mayor es el número de horas que los estudiantes escuchan este, in, en inglés, eh, ya sea por eh, escuchando la te, viendo la televisión, o en internet, vemos que es la varía. Mientras más tiempo pasan ahí, menor es el número total de errores que cometen tanto en el total de errores, eh, errores de sintaxis, errores morfológicos eh, 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 y en los errores, total de errores léxicos. Aquí, déjenme ver. Sí, también el total de errores léxicos. Entonces, esta variable, pues está hasta de moda, ¿no? Porque la mayoría de los chicos se la pasan mucho tiempo pues, en internet, ¿no? Entonces, se ve que pues tiene una importancia este, muy buena porque eso nos está indicando que mientras más tiempo pasan ahí, menor es el número de, de errores que, que los alumnos cometen en su, en su escritura. Y también tenemos un caso muy similar con la variable Q10. La Q, exacto, ah, sí, exacto, que la Q10 se refiere a las horas por semana tomando clases privadas de inglés fuera de tu experiencia en la escuela secundaria. O sea, este está relacionado con el perfil que vimos ahorita de antecedentes en el idioma inglés que tienen los alumnos antes de, de ingresar a la universidad. Entonces son como dos, como dos variables que arrojaron información muy relevante aquí para, para el estudio que estamos llevando a cabo. I don't know if you guys, uh, I think You already have uh, investigación cuantitativa uno, is that correct? Students, class. Can you repeat the question, teacher? You, you already have investigación cuantitativa uno last semester. Oh yes. And this sure. semester, this semester you're, you're taking Investigación Cuantitativa 2. Yes. I don't know how far uh, you've gone through the stati uh, statistical analysis. Uh, I don't know if, uh, is, this, is this teacher Matias who's teaching this uh, Investigación Cuantitativa 2? No, not anymore, sadly. No. Okay, it's another teacher now. Yes. I don't know if in this course you're going to study the uh, significant significant uh, indexes, like uh, in Spanish it's called valor P, eh, el coeficiente de significancia, right? Uh, you, you need to study that and understand that in order to Uh, really understand all these uh, coefficients, these numbers that we have here, right? ¿Qué significa que haya significancia en la, en, en, entre la asociación, en la asociación entre dos eh, variables, ¿sí? But wow, we just wanted to present this, and we're presenting this piece of information in Spanish because uh, one of the article proposals uh, that we sent Uh, the article is in Spanish. 
right? And we included this information, right? Obviously, the other article proposal that we sent is in English, the one that we sent for the ELT journal. Okay, we're going to continue. Muchas gracias, uh, doctora Silvia. Adelante. Bueno, de hecho, tenemos otra tabla más, doctora. Otra información más. Ok, perfecto. Sí. Continuar, por favor. Ah, perfecto, gracias. Sí, pues este es un resumen de, de lo que les acabo de, de mencionar. Este, que, que el modelo, el modelo que, que se trabajó, este es un modelo muy, pues muy interesante, porque habitualmente, no sé, ahorita por los comentarios que del doctor eh, Humberto, eh, me doy cuenta que ustedes, pues sí, los alumnos, eh, han llevado al menos un curso de pues, análisis de información, me imagino. Este, no sé si a estas alturas ya hayan llevado algo de relación de variables, regresión lineal simple, ¿sí? Eh, ¿Han llevado algo de esto? Realmente nosotros no hemos llevado una materia que de, de estadística, lamentablemente. Ok, okay gracias. Sí, bueno, eh, ojalá la, la lleven pronto, este, porque sí es un tema pues, muy útil. Es muy útil y en todas las áreas del conocimiento porque siempre existe el interés en saber si alguna variable, alguna característica está relacionada con otra o con otras, ¿no? Es, eso nos da muchísima información cuando estamos llevando a cabo un estudio de, de cualquier tema. Entonces, ojalá lo puedan llevar. Entonces, uno de estos modelos eh, que está ahí es el que le llamamos de Poisson. Eh, es un nombre particular asociado a un personaje del área estadística. Eh, aquí este modelo lo que nos dice es este, la variable que nos interesa aquí de respuesta tiene que ver con un número de errores en este caso. O sea, estamos, esa es la variable de respuesta, número de errores. Entonces, por eso usamos un modelo de, de Poisson. Entonces, en este caso, la, las variables, eh, vemos nosotros que existe, en el modelo que sacamos que existe, que existe una relación de las variables totales de errores, errores de sintaxis, de morfología y léxico, con algunas variables independientes. Por ejemplo, en el perfil lingüístico auditivo, Q6 y Q7, en este caso es el que más influye en la disminución de errores totales, de sintaxis morfológicos y léxicos, como lo mencionamos ahorita. Entonces, posteriormente, el otro perfil es el perfil lingüístico. Y en, or, en menor tamaño vemos que el perfil historial también tiene una influencia importante en el total de errores que se, que se cometen en, en, este, eh, pues en estos estudios que llevaron a cabo los profesores. Entonces, ¿eso cómo se puede interpretar? Que para la enseñanza, para la enseñanza de, de estrategias de escritura académica, es, en este caso que la práctica de la habilidad auditiva en los términos en los que fue investigada en el estudio, el alumno se puede apoyar en ella para mejorar su escritura académica. ¿Sí? Considerando bueno, que la práctica está disponible pues, todo el tiempo. ¿no? Entonces, pues ustedes yo creo que lo tienen ahí a la mano todo el tiempo, está, eh, estar practicando la, la cuestión auditiva, eh, ya sea en, en, en internet o escuchando canciones, eh, pues, haciendo infinidad de de actividades. Entonces, este estudio, la verdad, fue muy interesante porque arrojó resultados muy buenos, de mucha utilidad práctica, y como lo ha mencionado el doctor Humberto y el doctor Benjamín, pues este estudio, eh, este proyecto, ha dado pie a, a publicar un capítulo de libro, a este, enviar un artículo en una revista internacional con un nivel de impacto importante, son las revistas top, este, y también una serie de conferencias ¿no? que se han llevado a cabo a raíz de este estudio. Entonces es una combinación muy interesante que todo el, el análisis eh, y los resultados que obtienen en un proyecto, de este caso del idioma inglés, relacionado con un, un empujoncito de la estadística, pues puede hacer trabajos muy, muy provechosos ¿no? para todo el mundo. Digo, a lo mejor ya me vi, ya les echan aquí un rollo muy, este, <ríe> muy, muy amplio, pero yo creo que pues la idea es que ustedes, cuando hagan algún trabajo, creo que lo van a hacer de tesina, pues puedan hacer uso de este tipo de herramientas. Es, es un rollo motivador, doctor. Bueno, espero no cansarlos. <ríe> Adelante, creo que este, la siguiente lámina, no sé si... No, ya es, es eh, okay. diga en inglés. Gracias, doctora. 
Al contrario. So, me regreso a la anterior, eh, por si tienen alguna pregunta para la doctora Silvia Rodríguez sobre su intervención eh, en lo que ha sido los perfiles lingüísticos y el, la, la regresión de Poisson. O la estadística en general, lo que ustedes sí, yo... consideren preguntar adelante. Y tengo una en, sobre la estadística. ¿Qué libros, o sea, qué bibliografía nos podría decir para, pues, para tener las bases que necesitamos o qué recomendaciones existen? Ah, eh, miren, yo este, bueno, tomar libros, pues hay muchos libros, ¿no? Este, yo creo que por el área en la que ustedes se encuentran, yo creo que un, un libro interesante sería aquel que esté relacionado, que hable de cuestiones sociales que esté relacionado, que diga algo así, que estadística para este, ciencias sociales, por ejemplo. Eso se podría hacer un libro, ahorita, en este momento no, no tengo aquí el, en la mente un, tem, un, un título en específico, pero cualquier li, libro relacionado con ello, eso sería un punto eh, importante que pudieran ustedes este, iniciar. Pero también algo que ustedes pueden empezar y que me parece muy dinámico y muy interesante es que ustedes se metan a internet, a YouTube, y ahí hay videos muy buenos de diferentes este, universidades del mundo, centros de investigación del mundo, donde ustedes pueden elegir alguna, alguna de las conferencias o alguno de los cursos que estén dando ahí, sobre todo los de nivel introductorio. No se metan ahorita a un curso de ingeniería, este, de estadística para ingenieros o de, de área de ciencias. Agarre mejor uno que sea como más didáctico, más, más relacionado con, con cosas más introductorias y podrían empezar con un libro, por, con, un, un, con videos este, en el área de, de ustedes, ¿no? más de ciencias sociales, más básicos y posteriormente van ustedes escalando. Van escalando, créame que este, hacer algo de estadística en los estudios les da otro panorama. Otro sí. panorama, no porque los estudios sean malos, claro que no. O sea, son muy buenos. De hecho, la estadística, como les mencioné, nada más hace el empujoncito, porque el trabajo ya lo tienen. Solo basta así como que darle el, el empujón y listo, ¿no? Pero sí hay que saber darle ese empujoncito, ¿no? Entonces, qué bueno que, pues, que se ve que tienes interés en, en ir empezando en estos temas. Ok, gracias. Nada. ¿Alguna otra pregunta o comentario para la doctora Silvia? Doctora, como tuvo algunos problemas para conectarse al inicio de la sesión, eh, lo primero que hicimos fue presentarnos cada uno de nosotros. El, doc, el maestro Juan Antonio Torres eh, presentó eh, el taller, el taller ponencia y luego posteriormente me presenté yo, y luego se presentó el doctor Benjamin. ¿Nos puede, ¿Se puede presentar usted brevemente, por favor, para que los alumnos sepan en qué área de la universidad usted labora? Okay, claro que sí. Bueno, mire, mi nombre es Silvia Rodríguez Narciso, este, soy doctora en probabilidad y estadística, eh, profesora de, de la universidad, este, trabajo en el departamento de estadística en el edificio 30, este, y bueno, de las actividades que realizo brevemente les comento, o sea, bueno, doy clase en, en diferentes carreras, en, de diferentes niveles, eh, me dedico fuertemente a la parte de investigación, en el área de estadística, eh, en la parte de investigación pues trabajo principalmente con modelos de vida, de tiempos de vida para humanos, para piezas industriales, para todo lo que tenga que ver con cuestiones de vida. También trabajo ahorita para este, remo modelos estadísticos para remover contaminantes en el agua. Este, en el área de ingeniería civil también estoy trabajando en algunos temas. En el área médica y ahorita en el, eh, aquí apoyando este, con el, en el proyecto de, de inglés. Este, actualmente pues estoy como candidato en el Sistema Nacional de Investigadores. Sí, pues tengo mucho interés en la investigación y, y en la docencia. Entonces ahí estoy, si en algún momento, al, ya que haya pasado esta epidemia, si tienen alguna duda o quieren ir a conversar sobre los temas relacionados a la estadística, pues ahí los puedo recibir con mucho gusto. Gracias. Todo.
Sí, gracias, doctor. Gracias. Bueno, doctora, muchas gracias. Eh, lo que continúa es, es la actividad que le vamos a pedir a los, a los muchachos, a las muchachas, desarrollar. Eh, esto va a ser en inglés. Eh, bienvenida, si gusta acompañarnos. Si tiene otras obligaciones que cumplir, le agradecemos su tiempo de antemano. Y bueno, estamos pendientes de, de las actividades que todavía no hemos terminado en esta investigación, eh, que hemos estado trabajando en conjunto. Muchas gracias, doctora. Sí, muchas gracias a ustedes por darme este espacio y poder este, pues, compartir un poquito. Este, sí me tengo que retirar porque más tarde tengo otras reuniones. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, doctora. Buen día. Bye. Bye. So, the activity that we're going to ask you guys to do has to do with the, uh, uh, one of the essays from one of the participants in, in our study. And basically, we're going to ask you to, uh, what correction symbols will you use to mark the following essay in terms of accuracy regarding writing errors? And once you do that, then uh, hopefully you could also do more or less the same, but now in terms of complexity, right? So for this, uh, for this, I'm going to show you this. Uh, this is not the whole essay. It's, it's probably most of it, but not all of it. So if, 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 if we only have time, if you guys only have time to work on this first paragraph, that would be fine. The idea is that you try to spot the uh, written errors uh, in this first paragraph. So we're interested in seeing how you will identify the errors you can underline them and then uh, what kind of uh, error codes or error symbols or correction symbols you can use to identify whether this error is a morphological error or a syntactic error or a lexical error, right? Dr. Benjamin, I don't know if you want to add something here. Uh, no, nothing uh, to add. So do you consider what, like 10 minutes will be enough for this, uh, for analyzing this first paragraph? I think so. 10 minutes, I think is fine. Is this clear, students? Yes, teacher. Okay, so we're gonna give you 10 minutes. I think uh, we're not gonna have enough time for uh, the two, the two paragraphs. So just work on the first paragraph. We'll give you 10 minutes and when you finish, we discuss it. And then we show you how uh, Dr. Benjamin and I did it and, and the type of correction symbols that we use, okay? So right now it is 10.25. So uh, we will we will be discussing your corrections uh, at 10.35, all right? So please go ahead, get a piece of paper, or just do it there, or you can print it out if, if you can. Whatever questions you may have in the meantime, we're still here, okay? Teacher Juan Antonio, you could do the same. I have, I have some questions for you. Can I? Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, the thing is that um, I was, yesterday I, I was checking your presentation, but I didn't get very, well, the difference between the lexical errors in terms of wrong word or word choice. What's, what's the difference with the this? Same problem, the same problem I had at the beginning. Uh, Dr. Benjamin, do you want to uh, give an answer for that? Yeah, so there is a level of subjectivity, right, in interpreting these two. But basically, word choice 
uh, the, the is a word that is used that doesn't interfere with communication, but it's it's awkward. It's okay. not quote unquote standard uh, English, if you will. Is, Wrong. is that like collocation? I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that like collocation? Well, it could if it doesn't interfere with the communication, because sometimes an error in collocation can actually interfere. And have the wrong. You could have the wrong interpretation, right? Of right. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I would say collocation could be either word choice or wrong word, depending on the context. And that that's really the point is to see. Okay, word choice is less severe in the sense that it doesn't interfere with communication. It doesn't interfere with the message. It's just kind of weird. It's awkward. Yeah. Versus a wrong word, like okay, w we don't know what you mean or if what you're saying you know it, it basically interferes and with collocations like even like phrasal verbs things like that where if they use sometimes they use the wrong phrasal verb that really could say well does this person really mean this or this or or maybe just it doesn't even make sense it doesn't exist but it still interferes with the communication. So for me or for us, for the purposes of our study, the underlining question is, does it, in, does it interfere with the message? And if it does, then it's the wrong word. If it doesn't interfere, then it's word choice. Okay. So now another, another question. In terms of morphological errors and lexical errors, mm, it's, I, I, I didn't get it either. <laughs> um, you didn't understand the, the way that we classified those? or the, yeah, the, the difference between morphological errors and lexical errors. Is, is it like, well, lexical errors refer to words. And if they... In meaning. Communication mm -hmm. or meaning, right? Morphological, it's the... Because you have... Articles, prepositions, agreement, word form, verb tense. It's like maybe they, they didn't, they wrote something in the past, but they forgot to write ed. That would be considered morphological. Right. Okay. No, so I got it. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So morphological is really about the, uh, the quote unquote conjugation of the word, right? I mean, not just in terms of the verbs, but you know, think of it, I think of it like the, the conjugation, even applying to other types of uh, words and like article usage, right? Well, which form or which quote, uh, I'm using the word conjugation, like which yeah. conjugation of the article is most appropriate for that type of thing. So that's how I kind of think about it in terms of morphological. I don't know, Luis, if you have anything else to add there. Yeah, I think... Uh we can show our corrections, correction symbols in kind of a short definition. So I don't, I, 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 I don't, I didn't want to do that when you were discussing this because uh, the class learners they're working on this paragraph, right? Yeah, we can wait if you want until they finish, and then we can discuss, yeah, kind of look at some examples. Then we can show this. So, so Tonio. Uh, each of an Antonio and everybody can have a, uh, a clear idea of how we proceeded to uh, correct the, well, to classify morphological, lexical, and syntactic, and syntact, syntactic errors, and how we proceeded to correct those uh, according to the type of error. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm just waiting for learners to finish with this, and then we're going to show this uh, list of correction symbols, which actually, it took us quite a while to agree on every single correction symbol, uh, which we uh, retrieved from the literature. Right? Okay. Yeah, and one of the things we were thinking about, too, with separating the types into lexical versus morphological and syntactical um, was trying to, at the end of the day, f remember the focus on the lexical approach, the, the importance of developing vocabulary. And we feel that 
categorizing errors as lexical is kind of allowing us to keep that focus on on vocabulary and and really trying to uh, not neglect the lexical approach in the teaching practice and the learning process and so on. Okay, guys, three more minutes. If you guys want to take a picture of this paragraph, because I'm going, <clears throat> I'm going back to my camera, so we can discuss this. Is that okay? So then you can have it in your cell phones. <clears throat> yes, teacher. All right. So I'm going back to the platform to Microsoft Teams. I'm going to start sharing this. And, <clears throat> and now we, we're here, right? Can anybody share with us? Uh, how you proceeded correcting the first sentence, please. The first sentence is, Jimena and Wendy were walking on a dark street at night. Do we have any errors there? Something that you you thought or you think that you identified? Or is that okay? Is that sentence okay? Is that one okay? No errors there? I just, well, in the first sentence, what I marked was that the word, the word dark was not necessary because it says street at night. And for me, uh, writing the word the word dark would mean that the street is literally dark. Okay. So here we, you, you're, you're identifying a lexical error. So basically you're saying that <clears throat> that word is not really necessary. Okay. Yes. That's, that's good. The next sentence, they were going to eat hamburgers, but the restaurant was 10 blocks far from that dark street. Any problems there? Probably, um, I believe that instead of saying far from, they could use away from, probably like the word choice. It, it, that one is understandable, but maybe there is a better option. So you concluded that far from might be uh, kind of informal in comparison to away from? Yes. All right. Okay. That's very good. Yep. And then... The following sentence, Jimena asked Wendy what she will do if a man tried to kidnap them. Any problems there? I marked, well, I made a comment that before the first word, Jimena, maybe a proposition of that would be necessary. For example, then Jimena asked Wendy, so this whole paragraph makes more sense. Very good. So you're thinking that a transition, a transition word is necessary here to follow the logic of the idea that this writer is trying to transmit, to convey. That's very good. Yes, because it is a story after all. Yeah, because most of the sentence is just a sentence without any, any type of transition word or transitional phrase. And Academic writing is about how putting sentences together, right? Very good. Yes. Next sentence, Wendy said that she will, uh, <clears throat> Wendy said that she will, I'm sorry, <clears throat> do whatever, whatever the man wanted them to do. Anything there? Is that one okay? <clears throat> I marked that maybe instead of, of writing said, she one should write uh, replied or answered. When they reply or answer, okay. Next sentence, Jimena got confused and she said that if the man had a gun 
and he tried to kill one of them. She will give her, she will give her life for Wendy. Okay, it's a long sentence. Any problems there? Um, I was thinking about the previous sentence and uh, uh -huh. just because of the word whatever. Instead of whatever, I think I would use anything. I don't know if it, it has to do with word choice, if one is better than the other, but I don't know. I just thought about using instead of whatever, anything. Okay, that's very good. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to show you after we finish uh, with your uh, participation right now. We're going to show you how we did it, how Dr. Benjamin and I did it, what we found, and how we proceeded to correct this in terms of accuracy and in terms of complexity. We're, we're not going to have time to work on complexity. Uh, this is something that we're going to discuss at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Next sentence, Wendy said, well, I don't know if I will do the same because I will not imagine your life without me and I do not imagine my life without you. Anything there? Yes. Okay, tell us please. Um, I think instead of saying I would not imagine your life, it uh -huh. will be like I cannot imagine your life without me. Very good, right? Yeah, because uh, here we're talking about uh, the mood and the tense, right? Uh, we have to be careful whether we are hypothesizing something or we're still in the reality of that moment. And here the writer is switching from uh, one dimension of reality to another dimension, and that's a problem of uh, meaning, basically, right? Very good. Anything else there in this long sentence? Probably also, like, I don't know if here it's required parallel structure, but in the first part, like Malini mentioned, it said, I, I would not imagine, and in the second part, and I do not imagine. So in one part, it's using I would not, and in the second part, I do not. So I don't know if that has to do with parallel structures and if it's necessary. Yeah, we can discuss that when we show you uh, <clears throat> our, our corrections. Yeah, but that's a very good, that's a very good comment. Thank you. And finally, honestly, if he wanted to kill just one of us, I would prefer we both die. Okay, any problems there? Yes, I think instead of wanted, it should be would. If he would want, or if he would kill. If he would kill. Okay, honestly, if he would kill just one of us, I would prefer. Okay. All right, I'm going to share my screen again so you can see how we did it and then you compare your your own corrections, right? Let me go back to the presentation. Oh, I sometimes it just takes takes some time. Okay, now it's there. <clears throat> so let me go down. Remember, too, as you're comparing that the way we did it is not not the only way to do it. I, what we want to share with you here is the importance of sharing how we all evaluate learners and how, uh, it, the, how it's important or why it's important to share how you're uh, classifying certain errors when you're working with other teachers so that you do kind of use the same approach. But that doesn't always mean that, uh, like in our case, just because you don't have what we have doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's not, not right. Yeah. So here, teacher Juan Antonio, is how we uh, classify the errors and the type of specific errors. So here you can see the list of syntactic errors, morphological errors, and lexical errors, right? Obviously, uh, 
we we have another list which uh, examples and definitions for each specific type of error which we have here you see that so you were asking about word choice and wrong word here we have word choice as word choice is awkward but meaning is retained that's what dr benjamin just explained and wrong word is meaning is incorrect for sentence or unnecessary word or words. So there's a difference between these two types of uh, lexical errors, right? And you have uh, a description, a short description for all the other errors that we identify. Now I want to show you how we did it, Dr. Benjamin. Okay, I <clears throat> this may be hard to read. In fact, it's a little bit difficult. First, first accuracy errors, please. Okay. Um, all right, Luis, you're probably going to have to help me with this. For, I don't know if it's my screen, but I, it's hard to read. <laughs> you don't see it? <laughs> it's hard right. to read. Uh, the first thing that we did was to number the, the lines. Every... Every five lines, as you can see on the left hand, on the left hand side margin, the line number one. So you see a number one on the left, and then line number five, and ten, and fifteen, and so on. So with, by by doing this, it will be easier for us to say, okay, I I then I am putting this verb like this, or I'm correcting this 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 word like this in line two or line seven. That's the very first thing that we did. The second thing is we proceeded with the analysis of accuracy, uh, identifying the errors as, as accuracy or as complexity or as fluency. And for accuracy, what we did was, again, the same. We, we followed the morphological, syntactic, and lexical errors. So you can see here, sorry, you can see here that far, and this is one of the uh, corrections that some of the, that some of you did. Far is a problem there because far is informal. So we totally agree with changing far for away because far is kind of inf informal. So we underline far, and then on top of far we wrote WC. This is. Uh, word choice type of error. You see that? And then don't pay attention to the, the parentheses and the brackets, okay? That's for complexity. Right now we're dealing with accuracy. If you go down, let's see if we have any other, any other errors, accuracy errors here. And we have wood in line number 10. Right, well, it's also a problem as you can see, it is underlined. So, we underlined the accuracy errors, and on top of those, we wrote a correction symbol. And here for wood, we wrote bf verb form, right? According to, according to our correction symbols, our correction list, right. So here we have BF for wood, so we need to change that. And somebody already uh, gave us an option in this class. That's very good. We also underline your, as you can see. And then on top of your, we have pro. Pro, which means pronoun. But then we have three pros in our list, one for antecedent unclear, one for being something pronoun, and one for double subs. Obviously, uh, we need more time to explain what this really means and give examples of this, something that we don't have time right now, but we would be uh, happy to have uh, to explain this in another session if it, it is possible. That's something that we can discuss with teacher Juan Antonio. And then uh, in the same line, line 10 at the end, we underline we, Excuse me, me, and on top of that, on top of that, we wrote the correction symbol pro again, right? 
Uh, line 11 is okay. Line line 12 line 12 is okay. And in line 13 we have die. We underline die. And on top of that we wrote verb form. BF or verb form. These are the only uh, accuracy errors that we found related to uh, lexical errors and related to morphological morphological errors. We don't have syn syntactic. We, 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 didn't, we didn't identify any syntactic errors according to our correct to our list of syntactic, morphological, and lexical errors, right? So that's what we have. Right, so we don't have many accuracy errors here, as you can see. Any questions here? And what you're seeing here is um, one, I think this is Luis's copy, I had mine, and what you're seeing here is after we had gotten together, discussed each one of these, and uh, you know, re basically negotiated each of these error types to make sure that we were in agreement with each one of the uh, errors. And regarding complexity, you can also see at the bottom on the right hand side, it says clauses 38. And then, and then you can also see uh, T units 12. And then we proceeded to compute, to calculate uh, the ratio of, uh, for complexity. And, and, and the, in red, in red, we have the, we have, in red, we have the brackets, and in blue, we have the parentheses. And if I'm correct, uh, for every uh, bracket, we have what, a T unit, uh, Benjamin? Yeah, I think the red brackets are the T units, and then the, uh, I think, I think the blue are the clauses. Like yeah. in the blue parentheses or the clauses, and then the bra red brackets are the T units, I think, if I remember. Yeah, that's correct. For every T unit, we enclose that uh, using brackets, and for every for every dependent clause, subordinating clause, we used uh, parentheses, and that's how we proceeded. As you can see also, uh, let me see, so you can see the other paragraph. You see the other paragraph. Obviously, we detected more errors, and that's why you see all of this, right? And then you also see some numbers on the right-hand side, right? We don't we don't have time for this to explain this, uh, but obviously the idea was to share this with you. And if you have if you have further questions, if one of you or some of you might be interested in pursuing this kind of topic in your literature review and in your empirical study in the following semester, well, you're welcome to uh, approach any of us and ask any, any questions related to that. So then we can show you more, we can share more information in our final results of our two-year study. Right. Yeah, and if anyone's looking for books um, on statistics or even re <clears throat> or research methods, um, send me an email, and I'll be happy to share some uh, books in English on those topics uh, as well. And uh, of course, reach out to us if you want to learn more about this research, or if you want to share or discuss your research. Uh, we always recommend that you talk with as many teachers as possible to get uh, feedback on developing your ideas around this semester, your literature review, and obviously next semester when you begin thesis seminar. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, it, for, that's it for us. Uh, <clears throat> Teacher Juan Antonio, I don't know if you have something to say about this uh, uh, kind of workshop and talk. Yeah, and no, I'll just to say thank you very much for all this information. It was really interesting. <clears throat> I still have more questions, but I will ask those questions directly to you. <laughs> well, if you, if, if, if these are questions that you think uh, you, some of your learners or your class might be interested in, well, you can, we can just uh, access one of your classes on Teams, and so everyone can.
can see our responses, if that's okay. If this is more uh, private, then it's fine. We can uh, contact each other via our emails. Yeah, I think I'm related to these to the correlations that you did in your study. So, but okay. maybe I said maybe later we can get together again and then you can explain to us this aspect of the correlation. correlation. No problem. And I also want to say before I say goodbye, uh, if if you, Tonio, and and your class consider that I can have uh, a talk or a, specifically a talk about my some of my results for my PhD thesis, I will I will be more more than happy to share that with the class. So uh, so they will get to know. The, the topic that I investigated for, for my PhD, right? Okay. So I know that you have a syllabus that you need to cover. So if you find the time, if the students are interested in finding out what I did, I can just uh, design something uh, for them. I can simplify it for them and, and I can uh, be in one of your classes for 15, 20 minutes, if, if that's okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I, I, I will let you know. Yeah, sure. Anytime. I just have class from from 11 to, to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but I'm free in the mornings and I'm free after 2. Okay. From Monday to Friday. If you also want to consider Saturday, I'm also available on Saturday. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sunday, no. Sunday, no. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tonio, for giving us the opportunity to share this with your students. And again, you can, um, if, 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 if you don't have my email, my, my Gmail account, you can share that with them. So if they want to reach, to reach me or reach the Dr. Benjamin for further questions, that will be okay. Okay, I will do that. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tonio. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, man.